The Strutford Show, bringing retail into the future. Hello and welcome to The Strutford Show. I'm your host, Ang Naya. I'm also the CEO of Strutford, where our vision is the same as the vision for this show, to bring retail into the future. Every episode, I'll be joined by a guest who is leading or innovating in some part of the retail spectrum, from design to manufacturing to marketing and even to sales. We'll discuss trends, learnings and ideas and really try to figure out what the top performers in your field are doing. Along the way, we'll discover some lessons you can apply to your own career and hopefully even have some fun. All right, let's do it. So welcome to the Stratford Show. I'll also do an intro at the start of this. Um, I'm here with Martin Pittman, who's the Design and Technical Manager at Zero. Yep, that's right. So Martin, I think it would be good if we start with perhaps an overview of what, what your role entails and then perhaps we go into your, your journey. Okay, so uh, I look after all of the technical aspects of uh, making shoes for, for Zero. So anything from the stitching um, to, the, to the leather, which everyone knows. Okay, and that's at high level and you've got a team of designers under you. How does that work? Uh, no, so uh, the designers um, work with me rather than under me. Um, mm-hmm. I have a technician that uh, helps me as well um, with fitting and some um, some other bits and pieces like 3D printing. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, mostly I, I try to control as much as I possibly can. Yeah. You, said, you mentioned 3D printing. How are you using 3D printing in the design process? Uh, so we're mostly using it for aesthetic. Um, approval, so for souls. Um, but what we've just recently done is moved into digital last um, data, okay. uh, rather than exchanging uh, the solid last, mm-hmm. um, because it takes three days back and forth to the source, plus it's expense in DHL. Mm-hmm. We're now uh, sharing uh, by email, and then we're printing the last if required, okay. um, so we can measure them on our 3D printer. Hmm. I actually looked at doing this, because before we started Shopfit, it used to be called Stratagio and we were trying to make tailored shoes for men. Have I told you about this? No, no, no. Okay. So first we tried to vir- let you virtually try on all clothes before you bought them. Then we pivoted and with the technology, we would let you scan your feet at home and we would make tailored shoes for men right. and send that over to you. And we were looking at how can you make tailored shoes at scale. And so that's when I went out and spoke to the CEO of Bobux, the CEO of Overland. I'm like, is it actually possible to make these tailored shoes at scale? And they said, no, but we're interested in your technology. Um, didn't hear the second part, heard the first part where they said no. So I'm like, fuck that, I can do this properly. <laughs> so I spent three months. I spoke to the guy who helped Shane, Shane's dad, Tony. So Tony and Selmy, who's started Overland. Yep. He helped um, them set up the factories. So I spoke to this guy, learned how to make tip, like shoes. I was like, how do you create a system where you can scale tip, um, custom shoes? And one of the things I was looking at was 3D printing lasts. What I found was... It was difficult to use that because last thing would be quite robust because you're you know nailing stuff into it. Yes. So are you using it for the actual process or is it just for the prototyping? How we're, does that work? We're using it because we want to speed up uh, how do we get the last down and be able to measure them. Yeah. So it's definitely not for manufacturing purposes. Mm-hmm. Um. So, but but even so, you can still turn an individual last um, from the data for a manufacturer, um, which I know a few other large brands already do so. Um, so the way we're using it is to exchange the data mm-hmm. and get the information faster to be able to print a last takes an hour and a half on the machine that we're using. Okay. Um, and then, um, by the time we've hardened it, it's probably another hour later. Yeah. So in say half a day, half a working day, we can have the last printed um, mm-hmm. and measured and the data collect- collated. And if we're all okay and the fitting of the shoes work okay, then we can literally just press go and that's almost immediate effect. Awesome. So it's literally like three days faster. Yeah. Which is a long time in manufacturing. And it's three days over, because you would iterate back and forth, right? So you're going, yes. it's not just one time of three days. It's three days times like five or 10 iterations. Yeah, um, yeah I think five or 10 is probably a bit much, but yeah. let's say three, two, mm-hmm. two and a half to three times, you'd probably try some shoes fitting and then edit the last. Um, so what we could do is we can edit the last and then we can send the data back rather than sending the last back. So that actually... Mm-hmm producing what we require rather than writing some words yeah. um, and hoping that it's, you know, what we require is done so we can actually send the data back and forth so it's exact. Um, we've done this test. We've measured, I'd say, at least 20 lasts mm-hmm. and they are within 0.5 of a millimeter. Um, mm-hmm. So we, we find that as an acceptable uh, measuring tool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, how, would it be that 
Like that would be as accurate as having a real shoe line. Yeah, because you and I would measure differently with our eyes. Yeah. You know, I mean, even though the tape measure says the same thing, if mm. you position it slightly differently to what I do, um, you'd probably come up with a pro- we'd probably come up within a millimeter of each other measuring. So it's it's well within tolerance. Definitely. Easy. Yeah. I've just realized that. So the the purpose of the Strapit show is is bringing footwear retail into the future, and that's footwear and retail. So that might be from design to manufacturing to just marketing and the actual retail. So we might have listeners who don't know anything about design process. Right. For those who don't know, what is a, what is a footwear last? Okay, um, a last is uh, um, uh, basically um, a, a mirror of the foot, if you like. Um, every brand has a last to make a shoe. Without the last, you cannot make a shoe. Mm-hmm. Well, you can, but probably be inconsistent. Um, so the last is meant to represent the foot. Um, all different brands have different uh, measurements for their standards. Um, we try to uh, keep ours extremely consistent. Um, we know which parts are important for, for our brand, Sierra. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we always make sure we adhere to those. Um, but the last is uh, what you put everything of the shoe on. So without the last, you can't make the sole. Without the, without the last, you can't make the upper, the lining. Um, it's just impossible to work without. So it's a, normally it's seen as a, a piece of wood. It normally is um, a block. It's turned in a lathe. Uh, and then somebody would uh, style that. Normally the last maker would style that. Mm-hmm. Um, and as it moves into production, it becomes a, a, normally a plastic because plastic's easy to control. In production, it can take a few more hard hits. Yeah. Um, and, and then you move into to the plastic blocks, which is what you'd see on the production line of the shoe factory. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those? This is one of those, yeah. This is uh, one I've bought on today, just uh, so everyone can see what we're talking about. Awesome. So um, if if I'm someone making a shoe, how what's that process look like? Is it the sole comes on and then you put the upper? Is it all built on the shoe last? Yes, it's all built off the shoe last. Um, so the, the upper would be um, designed um, normally by a, uh, via vacuum forming machine. So you'd have a sheet of plastic which is heated up mm-hmm. and then it's vacuumed onto the last. And then the designer can draw on the, the upper. Okay. Um, there's another way, which is the more older, old fashioned way, yeah. um, which is quite traditional, which you can take the last, um, you can draw on the tape, um, and you can peel the tape off and make your patterns from there. Obviously, there's not just as simple as taking it off and, and cutting the patterns. There's a, there's a whole load of other bits and pieces that you need to understand and add. Yeah. But in essence, that's roughly it. Sweet. Um, and then once you know what upper materials roughly you're using, um, because they can vary. Some, some people use textile, some people use leather for others. Mm. Um, you would build the, the allowance for the sole, which is called the sole cavity pattern. So the upper can slip inside if you're in lasting or lasting underneath the, the last and then sticking the sole on afterwards. I mean, that's a pretty basic way of uh, how, a, how a design is done. But yeah. that's, that's, you know, uh, in, in essence, uh, the, the, the crux of it really. Sounds good. Cool. Um, it's watching the labels. Maybe just keep the mic a little bit closer. Okay, sure. That's, sweet. that's cool. Um, do you know how, because footwear lasts, I was doing some research back when we were trying to make tailored shoes for men. They've been around for about 150 years or so, and they used to be wooden and now they're starting to go into plastic. Do you know if it's changed much or perhaps the work you've done to change footwear lasts or is it? pretty much the same as how it started, say, 150 years ago? I think it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, I know that people are using scanners and getting the data of the last, which mm. is the bit that's really changed, changed the most. If you can have data, you can quickly exchange, mm. um, you know, because most most day, most uh, companies these days use uh, offshore um, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, India, Bangladesh suppliers. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're based in Europe or you're based in... in um, in Australasia, um, that's uh, you know that's a three day you know delay at least of postage. Yeah. So um, the data collection is definitely the thing that's changing most. I think making the last is probably quite similar to when it first started out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and and wood was probably used for production, uh, but it's definitely moved into plastic. I mean, many many years ago. Interesting. Okay, so um, I think what because you've been in actually perhaps let's, let's go into your journey and. Because you've been in the footwear industry for quite a while now, uh, perhaps just give us an overview of where your journey's taken you, and then we can dive into various different parts. Sure. Okay. So um, I've been in the footwear business for about twenty years now. Um, luckily for me, um, 
I probably work for one of the best training companies uh, for footwear in the world. Um, so I work for Clark Shoes in the UK. Um, they have a rather large office there um, of around about, it used to be about 1,200 people. Um, and the technical department is, you know, quite large and the training is amazing. Um, I was lucky enough to be sent to here and everywhere to get some really good training. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my journey started with Clark's and I actually started as uh, making sole models from 3D printing, funnily enough. So 20 years ago, okay. um, I actually started working with an SLA uh, printing machine. Um, so making prototype. And SLA is single, single layer additive? That's right, yes. Um, so it's the, it's the laser machine that when it hits the, the vata resin, it solidifies and then that's what builds the, the model. So um, Clarks was doing this 20 years ago. I think 25 years ago they were doing it. Wow. It's, it's a bit, yeah, a bit before I turned up. So. You hear, um, Adidas came out with that shoe, which is mostly like 3D printed and that was meant to be innovative, but you're saying Clarks was doing this. Yeah. So, um, I think. So Adidas have been doing it for production, where Clarks are doing it mostly for prototyping. So mm-hmm. that's probably where the difference is there. But yeah, they've been doing 3D printing for, I think, about 20, maybe 23 or 24 years. Okay. Um, and, and at that time in the UK, as I'm led to believe, uh, only Benetton, the Formula One team, and British Airways or British Aerospace mm-hmm. were the only two players that had 3D printing at that time, along with Clarks. Yeah. Well, um, so, yeah, I was really lucky to get involved in 3D printing quite a long time ago, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so we used to um, get the models from 3D CAD, we used to build them on the machine. We used to hand finish them back then. Um, the software wasn't available to put textures on like it is today. Yeah. Um, and then we used to use, uh, sheet wax and roll, uh, roll, heat the wax up, roll it into the, um, into the impression mm-hmm. and then stick the wax on the model. Um, from there, we used to make, um, silicon molds. Um, so we could then cast the model in the mold and then produce many, um, again for prototyping. I see. Okay. So it's a bit of a reverse engineering. Yeah. Um, because we used to actually make and stitch all of our upper, the prototype uppers as well at that time in Clark's in house. Um, which is, you know, amazing learning because these days you send off a design spec and you get the, get the shoe back. So you don't normally see all those details that go into it. Right. And you're not involved in the actual making of the shoe. Yes. It's like this is my spec. Yes. Make it and send it back to you. Yes. The problem solving these days is done via email words. Mm-hmm. And in those days, it was getting called over to when people were stitching the patterns together yeah. and working out what you're going to do to make this better. True. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, that's changed quite considerably. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, so Clark's used 3D printing for prototyping and, um, then we used to make the silicon molds. Um, then we used to pour um, polyurethane in using vacuum casting. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, um, I've actually just built one of those by hand. And Sierra now has a vacuum casting machine. You as well. built it by hand. Yeah, I've built it by hand. They're extremely expensive to buy. Yeah. So uh, we just went and bought all the bits and pieces and I built it by hand. So that's fully operational now. I need to see what this looks like. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's a kind of new addition literally of a, a month or so ago. Mm-hmm. And it's been tried and tested. And, it's that good. Um, we can actually take the microscopic bubble, bubbles that you get from pouring a glass of water out of the water. So there's no bubbles at all. What? So if you pour a glass of water, you see the microscopic bubbles spinning around. Yeah. Generally, if it's a glass and it's uh, around, that's the, you know, the creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I can put it in the vacuum casting machine and remove every single bubble that was once in that water. And this is the machine you made? Yes. Yes. Hand built. Okay. Yeah. Hand built. Um, so. We, you know, I, I'm trying to create a little bit of what, what I used to have um, yeah. because I didn't have it. <laughs> um, but now with Zero, we have a 3D printing machine. Um, we have uh, sheet wax that we're able to make um, boards of uh, texture to be able to roll in and then put on our models if we need to. When you say texture, what does that, what does that mean? What so does that look like? The, the texture, so if you imagine um, lifting up many, many soles of the shoes mm-hmm. and you see like a sandblast texture, Sometimes it could be a crisscross texture. Oh, so like the bottom pattern? Yeah, okay. yeah, but not so much the tread, but the texture that's on the tread. Interesting. So okay. the, the, the very, the very fine detail that's really difficult to, or used to be really difficult to reproduce. But yeah. these days there's software out there that you can actually reproduce the texture with mm. and you can print it on the model these days. And the purpose of the texture, is it mostly cosmetic or is there? Some functionality involved as well. Um, so initially it's cosmetic. Yeah. Uh, initially it's uh, for the design to see what that looks like. Cause again, we're doing prototyping mm-hmm. and then eventually, um, depending on the, the type of, um, 
the development, the soul would uh, the, the texture would have a functionality of, a, of the sole grip mm. um, to make sure that, for example, in the wet, um, there isn't such a thing as what we call aquaplaning. So if you had lots of circles that were were um, were sealed, and the water was in as you were walking on water, actually acts as a cushion to lift the the sole off the ground. Um, so we'd want to make sure that the right textures were actually able to allow the water to disperse mm -hmm. and not cause that effect. And if it's pushed off the ground, you, you slip. You, get, you slip, yeah. yeah you get uh, it, it Actually, mm -hmm. the sole will fail the, the slip test, which is carried out on quarry tiles. Okay. Um, so that's, there's a standard from... Um, and a quarry tile is very smooth. Yep. Uh, so there's a dry run and then you do a wet run also. Yeah. Um, so you would grade your sole um, slip on, on that. Cool. Okay, so you started off making 3D, somehow you were doing 3D soul printing, which yes. people are doing now, 25 years ago. Yes. And then what did that morph into? Um, so then um, I, I actually picked that up pretty quickly. It's something I was extremely interested in and, and, and loved every second of being there, which is strange, I know. But um, I quickly moved into how to make a last because it's good understanding the soul and the 3D printing and the molds, but actually how did you even get to get that shape in the first place? Well, again, we come back to it started from the last. Mm -hmm. So um, my manager at the time said, um, you know, there's an opportunity for you to learn about last making. Um, so I was like, that, that's amazing. I need to go and do that. So two days a week, I went to last making and three days a week, I stayed in the soul area mm -hmm. and they just started knitting together. So, um, Again, I was lucky. Clark's had scanning equipment way back when and exchanged data with the last makers okay. um, to make their production, actually grading their last by the data. Yeah. Um, you know, like I say, 20, 20 years ago. Wow. I, I talked to companies, and I was telling you earlier before we started recording, we talk to companies now and they don't have any information about their footwear or their footwear last. Yes. It's probably the most important information mm -hmm. um, that if you want consistency throughout your brand, then your footwear is what you actually need to capture, um, which I know is what you're working on with uh, Strutfit because I've experienced some of that when we've done some work together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Clark's had the, the scanning equipment um, from a company called Lectra. Um, it's a French company, extremely advanced in, in, in that part at that time. Mm -hmm. There are other companies around these days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I learned how to make a last, um, how to turn the last from the data, from the CAD files, um, how to grade the patterns. Um, it was, uh, it was pretty lucky, you know, um, there's not many companies that actually make their last in-house anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know the clerk still do. Um, it is a, is a pretty, pretty decent skill to have. Yeah. Um, knowing when somebody says it's a bit tight here or it's a bit tight there, what, what to actually do, where to add the, the measurement mm -hmm. required. Um, from there, I, uh, I started to become more and more interested in footwear. And um, so I went on a few pattern making courses at the time. So how to cut the patterns. Um, there was a really great guy that came in to class. He and the, the pattern is, is it the upper and how you cut it such that it takes shape? That's right. Yeah, it's the upper patterns, the lining patterns. So it's how to cut them, what allowances you need, mm -hmm. stitching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, from that, I went on to actually doing the full technical um, footwear um, course, which Clark's run in house. Um, again, I, I can't say how how many skilled people there were working there. Um, you know, people had worked in Clark's for 25, 30, even some 40 years. Wow. Um, so they've gone right through the manufacturing process of when Clark's had a number of factories in Somerset in the UK mm -hmm. um, to the office, which is which it once become, you know, because all the manufacturing was done offshore. Um, so I learned about footwear um, a whole lot, um, which took me probably about eight, eight or nine years of consistent and continuous training, um, including the fitting, um, the uppers, the soles, you know, um, even to the stitching. Um, yeah, it took some, I mean, I used to have shoe dreams. So I always know <laughs> that you're learning some stuff when yeah. you have shoe dreams. You know, okay. you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go, what was it about that pattern I had to do again? Yeah. You know, um, so that was pretty intense. Would you ever get up in the, I, I do this now where um, I wake up at like 4 a.m. and I'll send the shoes, my co-founder. Um, I'll send them a message and then I wake up at 10 or 9, whatever. And I'll check my messages and it was like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'll look into that. 
but I have no idea, no recollection of sending that message. Yeah. Did, did you have stuff like that? Yeah, I, actually, somebody, um, a coach that um, I was working with back in the UK once advised me to put a notepad and a pen beside the bed and literally write it down. You can go back to sleep pretty quickly after that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you just keep thinking about it. Oh, okay. So it's not even to like help you remember it later. It's just so you can go back to sleep. Yeah, yeah. It's literally, um, if some of this come up, it must be important because it's woken you up. So you need to write it down and then you can get some rest and then mm-hmm. deal with it in the morning. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a good way. I actually still have the notepad and pen by my bed now to do that because I still get some two dreams, funnily enough. <laughs> nice. Um, Sidetrack, but I, I remember listening on another podcast to... I think Einstein used to sleep with like a spoon. Sorry, he would have a spoon in his hand and like a metal pot underneath. And he would just hold the spoon in his hand and just fall asleep. And just as he falls asleep, he drops the spoon and it wakes him up. Right. And it's in that moment of falling asleep, he has a key inside yeah. and then he would write it down. So wow. sleep as a way of thinking. Yeah, maybe I'll get the spoon in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. So 10 years at Clark's and... At that point, is that when you achieve mastery or do you never achieve mastery? Um, I think you always need to be open to learning mm-hmm. um, because after I learned about the shoes, I actually um, went to learn more about leather because previously to working in Clark's in footwear, I actually worked in two tanneries for eight years. Mm-hmm. So I had a lot of leather experience. Well, okay. um, so that was uh, about the detail of the leather. Um, so I, I, And we made leather for all Clark's, funnily enough, in those tanneries. So... Um, so I, I actually went to um, do some sourcing for products for leather, um, and I used to source the, the leather for the, the boys' um, footwear, mm-hmm. kids' footwear, um, the men's footwear, and the linings across the whole business, which is quite a lot. That's, um, yeah. We used, how many how many shoes would they be selling at that point? Um, I think Clark's was selling around about sixty five million pairs of shoes at that time oh. uh, per year. Okay. And I know that we used to buy enough leather, um, which I believe, if I, my memory serves me correct, was about 130 million square feet. And if you think of the size of a football pitch, a mm-hmm. soccer pitch, um, we would be able to cover almost a thousand of those with the amount of leather that we bought for the footwear. Well, I need to look up the size of Auckland and see whether that would cover. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> I've never thought of it like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was lucky enough to do um, some leather sourcing as well for about three years. Which has been actually quite useful for Ziera because uh, many of those contacts um, I, I obviously haven't kept. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they, they're willing to help us out um, even where, you know, because we come up a lot of, against a lot of minimum order quantities because our footwear business down here isn't so large as it, as it once was in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and therefore, you know, those things put us in good stead. But yeah, we, I don't think you ever achieve mastery. And I think you just learn more by your mistakes <laughs> that yeah. you've made. Um, and the materials are changing all of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sole materials in the last five years have just gone crazy. The sole materials. Yeah. Okay. So the different types of sole materials. So if you think back, um, it used to be polyurethane rubber and thermoplastic rubber. Um, they were probably the main soles, sole materials used. Mm-hmm. Um, these days it's all these lightweight rubberized EVAs, um, soles that change color from one light to the next. Um, from change colors from the light. I think I saw this on Instagram. Someone was waving a UV light. That's, on. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and and also the the materials become uh, better wearing. Um, so although rubber was is always rubber, um, things like um, rubberized EVA, which is also known as PIP or if typical those types of materials, are becoming really spongy really quite well you know they wear quite well mm-hmm. and you know soft cushioning it's almost doing a midsole and a, and a sole job um where it, before True. before eva you would be risking some wear properties if you just used eva mm-hmm. um but it, it's 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 so clever and um, it's and it's lightening the shoes as well making yeah. them more flexible so normally you would have like an outer sole which is hard and then a midsole, which is soft, soft and has the cushioning coverage. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly like that. So think of a car tire. I mean, if it was made of um, EVA, like a, a foam, it would last in you know maybe seconds, mm-hmm. uh, depending on how you drive, of course. But the car tire is vulcanized rubber, so it has some really good wear properties. So if you think of um, vulcanized rubber on, on footwear, which we do have, mm-hmm. um, that's a really good wear properties, and you can lessen the substance. So. For women's footwear around about two two point five millimeters is a is a okay you know substance to use a rubber, 
and you wouldn't want it to be too thick because it then gets quite heavy mm -hmm. and also it's not so flexible with other materials. But the rubberized EVAs these days um, are um, taking over that job because you can use, you don't have to use them separately now as a sole and a midsole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you, you, I don't think you can ever master the materials. That it's just amazing how they how they keep running all the time away from you. So okay, got to keep up. So um, well, what would be good to delve into perhaps a little bit is the leather. Now I don't, so I was at Bobux for a year back when I think when we met. A leading technology and I learned a little bit about the leather like it depends on what sort of region it comes from because some regions have like mosquitoes so the, the leather might have yep. tick marks on it yep. it's just I just had no idea that's something that goes into it so perhaps just delve a little bit into what leather sourcing is at a high level yeah okay um, so leather sourcing first and foremost <laughs> is um, you should always um, know your source and um, how they practice making leather um, it's extremely important that um, the, where the animals are farmed, for example, if you're using South American hides, aren't farmed in a place where they're cutting down the rainforest to actually farm the animals. Mm -hmm. um, it, and, and obviously the, the leather comes from the meat industry. Nobody, nobody kills any animals um, just for the, for the leather. Oh, it, interesting. It, it's only for meat. Okay. Um, so the leather is a, is a byproduct of the meat industry. Right. Um, so first and foremost, always know the source of where the leather is coming from. You know, um, we all know how how um, the rainforest is being destroyed over a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, we definitely need to make sure that um, the, the tannery is um, in a good place. So um, the raw materials: South American, North American, goat, sheep, um, and then domestic. So domestic, depending on maybe it's Chinese domestic or New Zealand domestic or uh, UK domestic. Animal, depending on the type of article you require. Mm -hmm. So, um, first of all, is knowing the article that you want. Generally, the tanneries know what, what to select to make the, the article on um, for you. Um, so, yeah, sourcing is about build up of, first of all, making sure the source is um, certificated, really, if you can. Um, I know the British Leather Corporation do a number of things to help companies and tanneries mm -hmm. if they've been, uh, they, do a, they do a bronze, silver, and, and gold award. Um, if you're under the bronze, um, they'll help you get up to the bronze and then help you keep moving up and hopefully you get to gold. Okay. Um, this is this is a good source to use. Um, it's willing to improve their environmentally, um, like there's a lot of water waste um, from from a tannery. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's you know it's important to know your source. Um, from there, um, it's about your brand and it's about how long can you afford to wait for the leather. Um, so if you're operating in China um, and the leather's coming from India, there's obviously you know um, some organisation required from the brand to make sure they're ordering the products at the right time, mm -hmm. to make sure they can get there in time for production, also to make sure that the quality is consistent, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's actually quite a minefield, but you do learn quite quickly. Uh, you would have to. Yes. There's probably um, not a lot of room for error. When you're not making production, um, you learn very quickly on where and where not to buy. I see. So, so, for example, if some leather turns up and it's not what you imagined it to be, um, you, you struggle and you generally try to make production. But if you're not making production, you would definitely think uh, twice about going back to that source again. Mm. Okay. So you did leather, and is that just at the end of that you moved to New Zealand? No, I'm. I actually went back into uh, doing um, shoes again. So, um, luckily for me, I've worked on men's, women's, and children's products. Um, technically. Um, so I actually started off um, doing uh, women's, um, then I went to children's, and then I finally went to men's, and then I left for New Zealand. So I had a, a quite a nice round, rounded sort of journey really in Clark, so it's quite good. Awesome. And now you're at Zierra, leading design and technical. Tell us a bit about that journey. So you've been there, is it? Uh, nearly four, four years. years now, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got this amazing opportunity to come and live and work in New Zealand. Um, I always knew I wanted to live abroad, but I just didn't know where the opportunities were because shoes normally means it's Asia or all Asia. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I was so lucky that I got this opportunity to come work for Ziara. First of all, the, the brand is just, um, it's just so cool as in maybe the shoes aren't so cool or weren't so cool, but the way that they operate is so innovative, um, and also they're not willing to, uh, they're not worried about actually striving forward into new technologies, 
Um, they back their people. Um, so yeah, I just got this amazing. It was almost like a mini class, yeah. but it was too good to be true. When you say they're not worried about moving into new technologies, you mean they're willing to embrace? New Absolutely, technologies? yeah. I mean, you know, they they are willing to move into new technologies, and it's I I, I strongly believe it's going to really start to roll in. Um, in the last eighteen months, I think we've made massive, massive strides forward in the product, um, in in the design of the product, in the in the leathers that we're selecting. And the other materials that are environmentally friendly, mm-hmm. um, and having the printing machine and getting the vacuum casting machine. Um, also, we really updated the website, okay. and uh, so we're always looking for new technologies. And the company is not afraid to move into them. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the managing director Andrew Robertson, uh, he will back you. You know, you go with a business idea. He will back you if he thinks it's right. He will back you. The whole senior management team gets involved, and it very quickly moves into this is a good idea. To we're doing this, okay? You know, so this is a new experience because in a larger company it can take a good year to eighteen months to turn the ship around. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's really exciting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I was listening to maybe Atomic Habits or another book. I oh, know no, so it was a podcast, but basically it was saying the difference between like an entrepreneur because everybody has ideas. Everyone says, oh, this would be a good idea. But then the execution is the hard part, right? Ideas are cheap. The idea for Strapler has been around for 20 odd years. Um, but the execution is really difficult. So it's great to see that within a company, not only do you have ideas, but you're executing them on them really quickly. Yeah. And, and you need a strong team behind you to do that. I mean, I, I have the, some of the knowledge, but there's uh, other things where you need, you know, another 20% from someone else, 20% from somebody else. Mm-hmm. But in Sierra, I think they've nailed it. You know, uh, the senior management team, uh, again, you know, they just see it. They see the future. They mm-hmm. just see what's required. And uh, once, you know, once you've got five out of six people or seven people agreeing, it very, very quickly um, moves ahead. And we're not afraid to uh, agree or disagree and commit either. It's a new thing, you know, okay. where not everyone agrees, but if you if you commit to something, then everyone's in. So everyone's right. in on that. It's like a it's like a board decision where not everybody has to agree, but once it's agreed, then you, you back it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you get that. You get that feeling, you know. You never feel like somebody's gonna throw you under the bus in mm. the last minute. Um, which is which is a great feeling, you know. Um, and I think it's a Kiwi way as well, you know. Um, which is a, also a great thing that I've learned since being here. The culture is quite different, yeah. Um, but uh, in in a very supportive way. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm enjoying that too. Awesome. How do um, let's talk about brand. So brand is weird because sometimes it sits with design, sometimes it sits with marketing. How do you think about that in Zero, and how does the how does it work between? Like, yeah, are, are you guys? pretty cohesive in terms of how you think about that as they're back and forth yeah what's that dynamic like? yeah sure i mean i mentioned 18 months ago how we've really moved forward so i think the company has done really well to put some really key pillars in place and when i say pillars i mean people mm-hmm. um and i would say that in my experience it's the most cohesive i've ever known a brand to work bearing in mind i've only worked in two mm-hmm. um however um, we were a bit disjointed, you know, we were doing some great things in design, but they weren't being marketed properly or, or marketing were doing a great thing, marketing stuff and the design didn't quite come through. Yeah. I mean, everyone seems to be on the same train and pulling in the right direction. Um, uh, yeah, I, I have to say that the cl- is a very close relationship. Um, so for, for brands, cause I know some brands struggle with, so the design and marketing, and as you say, there's, there's this one. What would your advice be, or how did you manage to turn that around? You mentioned there were some key pillars added. Was there anything else? Like, what techniques would you recommend for these sort of? Yeah, um, I think companies? I think with the people, you need the skills. You need the skills first from the people, and they need to be rounded and experienced enough to help to know how to deal with the conversations. Um, because what, what does that mean? So does that mean a brand person needs to know a bit about marketing and? Oh, sorry, a, a marketing person needs to know a bit about design and design person needs to know a bit about marketing. I think they need to have a bit of an appreciation, definitely. But first of all, if you haven't got that person that knows um, how to interpret that conversation correctly or how to actually put that into a way of working well, mm-hmm. then it becomes difficult before you've even started. So we have a new head designer, a new head designer probably a year ago, um, Rosie Jameson. Um, you'll see her all over our Instagram stuff. Okay. Um, and, and and she's just got this best personality of a head designer you probably ever want to work with. Um, we have um, Amanda who's come in and she's running the web website of things, digital things. I mean, she just knows her stuff. 
uh, we can see what she's trying to achieve and she can see what we're doing and it all just starts to link in and we've got the marketing and we've had a big boost of a few um, different people come into there um, and, and, and it just it really does just knit the uh, brand the brand together mm -hmm. um, and it's made a huge difference I think to everybody's life less stress yeah. and more positive work everyone's pulling in the same direction exactly yeah. and it, it just you just actually don't mind getting up and going to work in the morning because mm -hmm. if you need to speak to somebody and it's you know not all the conversation is easy but if you need to have a difficult conversation at the end of the day it's only about the product it's not a personal thing mm -hmm. we have that difficult conversation and like i said once we've uh, agreed uh, we're committed and that's the direction that we all go in so, i like it yeah it's a it's a very good feeling cool and on the i had a, a, a crowdsource some questions and one of them was regarding so brand. So first, perhaps tell us a bit about what the Zero brand means, and then how do you stay true to the brand values whilst changing with trends? Because trends change every year. But how do you keep up with trends while staying true to what is Zero? Yeah. So Zero is uh, well known for uh, comfort and uh, comfort technologies, and uh, I'm not going to talk about what they exactly are, <laughs> um, but our customers out there will will know. Yeah. Um, and we don't ever move away from that. Uh, from that comfort story. Um, we design around that, which is very difficult to do at times, mm -hmm. but we're, we're definitely getting there. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to be a brand. It is harder, but we standardize things like our lasts. Um, we make sure. Which is a new thing you put on. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a definite, it's not so, it's such a new thing. It's just definitely done all of the time now, okay. rather than 80% of the time or, or 90 percent of the time um that allows us to work smarter in production on how we create other things and some other exciting technologies that we've got coming through as well um, um the way that we use those becomes more um, able and not so costly when you're opening different mold sets up um, we can use one mold to fit many rather than one mold to fit each individual thing. And when you're talking mold, you mean what is the mold? Is it a foot, foot mold? Uh, it could be sole? something like the insole. Okay. Um, it could be something like the, the sole molds. Mm -hmm. um, but it's creating that consistency that your suppliers also understand as well. Because if you keep changing it all of the time, they've got to learn again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So you may get two seasons in and then you change something and then it's, I've got to learn again. So you're it's much harder to keep the consistency when you're learning every year or every two years or something. Mm -hmm. It's much easier if you keep that consistency throughout the next five years. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not talking about designs and design looks or colors. I'm talking about the way that you make the product and the way that you can consistently make that and ultimately in bulk production because that's what the customers see, not just the one or two samples you make look beautiful that are sat on the shelf in the office. Yeah. Um, so yeah. All of that as a brand is really hard to keep up with, but we never move away from those things. And um, it's really well understood, which is important by everyone it works in, in the, that area, in the brand, in the office. Um, and um, it's got to be upheld. It's got to be upheld. Um, so yeah, we're known as, for our comfort, we're known for having removable um, footbeds. Um, so people can put their own footbeds in if they've got some foot health um, things that they need to address. Mm -hmm. um, we are known for adjustability on, on the, the uppers. So again, if um, you're slightly narrower, um, sorry, slightly have less volume in your foot um, compared to somebody else, you can pull the strap a little tighter perhaps, so okay. it still fits you well. Mm -hmm. um, we are known for uh, the quality of our product and we use lots of leather for our uppers and for our linings. However, having said that, we are using some more textile lining now, but it's not just any textile lining. It's actually recycled 100% from plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. um, so oh. we want to do our bit for the environment where we can. Um, and that is um, actually um, all certificated. And the supplier will send us um, how many bottles we saved going into landfill or the ocean um, every uh, six months of our manufacturing. Do you that. communicate that with the customers? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, we just installed it for our product that will be going into store in January 2020. Yeah. So uh, look out for that. For sure. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and so in terms of responding to design trends or even perhaps what does the design cycle look like in a year? Um, do you start, I know 
at, at other companies, they, they almost start two years in advance because that's just how long it takes to get samples and get production done. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we, we've narrowed ours down slightly. Um, we've got to about uh, 17 to 18 months at the moment. So we're predicting about 17 to 18 months ahead of when the product hits the, the shops. Mm -hmm. So it's normally about a year's development and then, or maybe a bit over, maybe 14 months development. And then the rest of the time would be for ordering and production and side of things. How do you predict 18 months in advance? Um, well, we've got this crystal ball. That we, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's so our designers travel to Europe um, because what we find with this styling in Europe is it's slightly further forward, um, about a year um, ahead of what happens in Australia and New Zealand. So that's mm. quite handy for us. Um, however, it's a bit of a bit of a trip um, to visit Europe from New Zealand, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we also use a trending um, website as well called WGSN. Um, and our, our, all of our designers have access to that, so they look at that and they interpret that trending because you know some sometimes the feathers don't quite fit in the, in our shoes like they're trending, but you know it's about the interpretation of what works for your brand and what you take out of that. So that needs a lot of translation, mm -hmm. but it's you know showing you the trends of what's happening across the globe. And that's like a global website, which a lot of public companies would use. Um, I, I would have thought so. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, and then and then we start sort of um, looking at what's around and the new technologies. We're all, we're, like I say, we're always keeping our fingers in all sorts of pies of technologies. It's really really important. And we and, and I was I was talking to you earlier before we you came on here, mm -hmm. and um, we we are lightening all of it, lightening in weight all of our shoes um, by around about thirty eight percent or so by using different materials. Um, so. We've shown a few people this at uh, a conference that we had in Adelaide a few months back. And honestly, everyone just was taken back by it. Uh, it's so, such a strong thing to do. I mean, that's mad. It's like almost half the weight it used to be. And this is for, what type of footwear is this for? This is across all of our footwear, including dress footwear. Wow. Um, so uh, I'm not going to give away the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, it is true. It is absolutely true. Yes. Um, which is exciting. And our sales team have gone out and they've been excited about it. I mean, what better to give your sales team than a product they're excited about? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need realms and realms of paper with information on. They just, they just see it, pick it up, feel it and go, that's amazing. For sure. And for a customer in store, they don't even have to try it on. You could just say, Hey, hold this shoe. Yeah. Does this feel like a normal shoe? Yeah. We're doing some branding around uh, the awareness of the light. You know, lightweight footwear that we're producing as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, uh, and it's going to be quite exciting. That's crazy. I, I might have to give myself a pair. <laughs> um, what else is worth? Um, oh, I had a question from a friend of mine. What makes a shoe beautiful for you? Oh, um, so I think first and foremost, um, coming from a comfort brand, I've got to say the fitting and the comfort. Mm -hmm. So it's got to fit well. It's got to support your foot well. And um, I think that's, one thing, you know, we talk about bliss in Sierra, creating bliss for customers. So, I mean, it's like putting on a pair of slippers, right? You get home at the end of the day, your feet are killing you because you've been in your high heels all day. Well, perhaps not you, but... Probably not me. <laughs> I have tried it once and I was like, how do women do this? I don't understand. But you put your slippers on and you do get that different feeling, don't you? You know, you, your feet just, you know, they go, oh yeah, this is, this is comfortable, you know, this is cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to be walking around town in your slippers or well, hopefully not, but you know, it just gives you that feeling. So we want people to feel like that when they put our footwear on that they do need to wear all day. Mm -hmm. And they may have, uh, you know, that foot deformity or a sports injury that's causing them some pain. So I have to, first of all, I have to say the beauty is in when you put it on and the feeling, you know, gives you that feeling of that's really comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows that in reality, unless you like the shoe, you will never pick it up in the first place unless you like the look of it. Yeah. So we try to create a very soft, you know, supple leather um, with a leather lining. So you can not only see the quality, but you will be able to feel it. That will be part of your comfort experience. So we, you know, we try to create stuff that has perhaps a little bit of depth in the leather, like a bit of burnishing or a bit of extra finishing. It looks more valuable. Mm -hmm. So think about Europe, think about Portugal or, you know, Italian type styling of the leathers. We try to introduce some of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's good at, as good as the Europeans as making you know leather and making finish and finishing them beautifully. Um, so we have to take that into consideration where we're making our production. Yeah. But at the same time, we try to create that so we know that's important for the customer. So that's part of the look. 
So it's got to be the design, then it's got to be the materials. And then when you put it on, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and with the lightweight uh, stuff that we're doing, um, we just think that when you pick it off the shelf, you'll be amazed and intrigued to know why it's so light. So that will get the conversation. So sure. what makes footwear beautiful? I think overall it's the comfort, but you've got to want to pick it off the shelf in the first place. Yeah, so it's form and function. Yes, and of course, um, the one that no one likes talking about is if the price is right, then you'll probably buy it too. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's always, you know, always that to take into consideration, which is a tough one, you know. It's a tough one for brands out there at the moment. Um, things are getting more expensive um, to make product. Um, oh, okay. Um, things are getting more expensive to make product. Yeah, um, you know, unless you're making tens of thousands of pairs in one run, um, it's difficult to work in large factories. Um, so larger factory runs are generally moved away from China these days because of the labor rates have gone through the roof in China, as you probably well. Oh, well, how much was oh, okay, there? okay. How much have they gone up? Um, Quite considerably, I'd say as much as 40% in well, the last five. I did hear people years. were moving from um, China to Vietnam. Yes. So I thought it was more around sort of TPP cities or something. No, that, that's, I mean, that's another thing that can drive some of that. Yeah. Um, it depends which country you live in, um, with, um, depending tariffs back into the country. Uh, luckily for us in New Zealand, we're tariff free from all of the countries. Oh. Um, so we can pick and choose. Yeah. Um, however, in New Zealand, as you know, there's not as many millions of people as there are in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, making lots of production becomes difficult. Um, we don't want to hold thousands and thousands of pairs of stock. And, and to be honest, not many retailers do. Mm -hmm. So we need to work in factories that are, you know, um, are able to make smaller runs. And unfortunately, they don't really live in Vietnam or Indonesia or Cambodia. And they're set up for the larger players. Um, in, in fact, we've we've been in there, we've worked in those places, but we generally find that the pricing is actually higher than in China because they want to, the larger runs because there's more people on the line, the lines are longer, the manufacturing lines are longer. Yeah. Where in China, um, it's scaled down actually um, because everyone's moved um, away from China. Mm -hmm. So we're actually benefiting from those people moving away from China which lowers the minimum order quantities that we can actually operate with. Interesting. Which actually lowers the amount of stock that we need to hold in our warehouse. Yeah. Oh, so much goes into that side. Yes. So I didn't really answer your question about beauty. <laughs> so I think, first of all, it's you've got to like it on the shelf. Yeah. Um, you've got to also like the price. And then you've got to, it's got to feel comfortable for when you put it on. Mm -hmm. So whatever that means to you is what, what beauty is. Cool. And how about durability? I had a friend ask, He's currently shopping for shoes and he wants a shoe that he can wear for multiple occasions and it's going to last. So if I'm a shopper and I'm looking for a, a shoe which is going to last, what should I be looking for? Yeah, so you mean a dress shoe or you mean... I think he means... I, I recommended a desert boot because you can sort of dress it up and you can sort of just okay. wear casual. Sure, but in terms of just footwear in general, what makes... Uh, if I'm comparing two different types of shoes... Yeah. What should I be looking for in terms of durability? Okay, so I mean, leather leather is probably the most durable that you can buy. Um, that you know still feels nice, looks looks premium. So I'd say leather, something with a leather upper, um, something with a leather lining, perhaps. Um, but um, if you want real durability for the soles, you know, rubber rubber would be the way to go. Um, polyurethane is is okay as well. Mm -hmm. uh, rubber's rubber's by far the best. Vulcanized rubber. Um, and then it's about, you know, how, how many times you're going to wear those and what you're going to wear them for. But we have a lot of our customers, you know, um, they've had shoes for 15 years and 15 years. Yeah. And then, and then they say, Oh, my shoes worn out. Um, what? you know, um, so which is great, right? Yeah. But actually, um, it, from a brand, you're kind of caught in the middle, aren't you? Um, do you really want somebody to buy a pair of shoes and wear them for 15 years? Or, or do you actually want them to? you know, get a, a really good amount of wear out of them for two years mm -hmm. and then come back and buy another pair because it's good value. Yeah. It's a very difficult one to ask customers. True. Um, but from a from a selling viewpoint, obviously, um, we, we make shoes to be as, as durable as possible. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's like having a leather jacket. If you don't look after the leather on the jacket, it'll wear on the on the elbows, you know, um, before it wears anyone else, anywhere else, because your elbows are going onto the tables and mm -hmm. you know you're talking and stuff. Um, but if you, you can condition that leather jacket with creams, but if you never do, it will wear quicker. Right. So it's the same with shoes actually. If you don't feed the leather, if you don't look after the leather with the creams that are offered, 
um, whether it's in store or whether you go and buy it from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Actually, the shoe will look older quicker. Um, mm -hmm. So it's also it's the part of the durability thing is for the customers to also look after their after the shoes once they've got them. They don't just um, go in a box after you finish wearing them because yeah. the you put them in a cardboard box, it actually draws all of the moisture. The, the, the cardboard draws the moisture from the other materials that, the sh that are in the shoes. So if you have a lovely oily leather and you put them in a shoe box, the shoe box is actually acting as uh, sucking out the, you know, the, the niceness of the leather. Yeah. So, you know, you should probably store them in a room temperature, for example. Okay. And you should spray them with a, if it's a suede, with a suede, a waterproof protector, mm -hmm. you know, four or five times before you even think of wearing them, perhaps. And then every week, every week, this is how you keep your shoes and the durability. Um, so a leather wrapper, a rubber sole, probably the best, but also it's also for the customer to look after the, the product as well. I need to get myself some shoe creams. I have a shoe tree. My mum got me a shoe tree. Oh, well, there you go. That's a start. Yeah. And I was like, how does it, because it had like a spring mechanism. I couldn't figure out how to work yeah. it out. So with Zero, what we're doing, because we recognize that we haven't perhaps been um, relaying that message well enough to our customers, mm -hmm. we're now putting the shoe creams um, and protectors recommendations on the box labels. Um, so if the customer does take the box on, on the occasion, mm -hmm. they can just take it back into store and say, I bought these shoes, I need to buy some stuff, and this is what was on the label. Or they can actually just take a photo with their mobile phone and email it to somebody and we can recommend what they need to go and buy. Awesome. Um, you know, it's about it's about helping people be aware of what actually looks after their footwear. For sure. Perfect. You mentioned earlier that you learned most from your failures. Would you be willing to talk about one of them? Oh, okay. So, I mean, you can, I don't know your failures, so you can bring up any one of them, whatever yeah. you're comfortable talking yeah, about. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, 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 okay. Um, I think it's probably still happening for most people today. Yeah. Um, so uh, in, my, in my wisdom, I decided that the leather was too expensive for a particular shoe that we were um, designing and developing. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, this was on a cow base, so um, around 16 to 18 square feet of, of size. So I decided the leather's too expensive. It's much cheaper coming from uh, Pakistan. Um, and the goat skin is only like, you know, a, a fraction of the price. I think it was something like 80 cents a square foot less than what the cow leather was. Um, but it was for a boot. Um, so little did I think about that, but the, the usage of the leather and the size of the patterns that you need to cut from each skin, mm. um, is, uh, large on making the boot. Um, so although the cow leather was more expensive, the cow leather was much larger, so you could cut more from the cow. Right. But the goat skins are actually only around about four to six square feet. Um, and in one boot, it was four and a half square feet. Um, so um, it, the cutting coefficiency went right the way down. And I was really proud of myself going around telling everybody how much I managed to reduce the leather cost. Yeah. But actually, I increased the, the X factory price of the boot by making the factory cut from such small skins mm -hmm. that they were throwing more away than they were actually using. Some of them were four when you needed 4.5. Yes, oh. yes. So, um, you know, I know this goes on for a lot of people still today and sometimes for me, but not so much from the fact of making the you know the mistake on purpose yeah um so that's a really good lesson for the that was a good lesson for me to learn and it's something that you initially do now you look at the shoes and you look at the size of the patterns mm -hmm. and you decide is that leather going to be really suitable for that in in production mm -hmm. so that that's that was a failure because um the shoe actually costed um two dollars out of cost um which reduced the the business uh, the margin for the business at the time which is obviously very important. So, um, yeah, I, I, I remember getting spoken to about that. <laughs> How long ago was that? Um, uh, it's probably when I first started getting into the technical side of shoes. So, yeah. uh, yeah, a long time ago now, probably about 10, 12 years ago. I suppose. Probably, probably never made that mistake. Again. No, no. I mean, you certainly look at things, you know, those types of things. For um, sure. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, it's been great talking to you. I don't have anything else. Is there anything else you think is, is worth mentioning? Or you... um, yeah, I mean, like we've spoken about Structfit, you know, on many occasions. And uh, I, I love, I absolutely love what you're trying to do and what you're going to achieve. I'm sure of it. I know mm -hmm. your attitude. 
Um, I just think, um, again, from New Zealand uh, viewpoint, is that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to get out of their house and go to school. It's not easy, you know. They may live out in the sticks. Um, they may be, um, you know, uh, elderly, and perhaps the, their help is a little further away. Um, so I, I love the fact that you, what you're creating is something that people can use in their home. Um, and, you know, online is becoming massive, right, for everybody. For sure. And this is just going to aid those companies to be able to sell more confidence online. So um, I'm really looking forward to the progress of this, and I can't wait for you to you know, get this uh, across many businesses so uh, I can have another look. Cheers, man. Appreciate the plug. That wasn't paid for. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay me later. No worries. <laughs> awesome. Cheers, man. All right, cool. Great talking to you. Great. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Strutfit Show. I've been your host, Ang Naya. And if you enjoyed it, if you found some parts where you were like, hmm, this has added some value to my life, then please share it with a few other people that you think would also value this information or that snippet. And when they like it as much as you did, I'm sure they'll thank you. If you're interested in what we're doing at StrutFit, head to our website at www.strut.fit to learn more and get in touch with us. If you want to get in contact with me directly, you can reach me at ang at strut.fit. All right, that's all, folks. Till next time, take care.